Hi, everybody. This is the investing teacher, a high school science teacher teaching others how to invest. And here I have an uh, interview with a very entrepreneurial uh, high school student named Jack Rosenthal. Hi, Jack. Hi, college hey. student. College student. College student. I'm sorry. High school into college. Well, what year are you in? Freshman? Freshman year, yeah. Great. Where, where are you going to school? So I go to Babson, which is 20 minutes outside of Mass uh, Boston. Oh, great. Oh, awesome. And um, so, Jack, you actually reached out to me and uh, definitely like saying that sometimes I try to reach out to others. But when I saw someone reaching out to me about the very entrepreneurial spirit you have, um, definitely wanted to take, have a good conversation with you. Um, so, Jack, you want, you want to just give me a brief overview of what your general investing philosophy is? Yeah, totally. Okay. So first off, you know, introduction to all your listeners out there. My name is Jack Rosenthal. I'm an 18 year old investor and entrepreneur. I go to Babson. Really lucky I connected with you and I'm glad we could uh, do this episode tonight. I'm also an author. I wrote this book, Teen Investing, which has become a top selling book on Amazon. You can uh, go get it, Teen Investing on Amazon. Um, but anyway, yeah, like a little bit about my entrepreneurial journey and where it began. I started something called the Young Investors Club when I was 14. I started trading my first stock when I was eight years old. And I started my first business when I was six years old, selling cool paper planes over the internet, coolpaperplanes.com. We, uh, we sold paper airplanes. We mailed them out to people in envelopes. And we ended up selling 70 airplanes. We made 70 bucks. Uh, that was my first business when I was six. And I've been uh, you know investing ever since. Very cool. Um, how, what made you think about doing something that at such a young age? You know, I have no idea. I can't remember what I was thinking that it was 12 years ago. Crazy to imagine at this point. Um, but I really had a passion for making paper airplanes at the time. And I just kind of turned that passion into a business. And I think I was the first online website ever to sell paper airplanes. <laughs> well, that's great. Your parents probably helped out a little bit with that. I was, you know. oh yeah. I mean, I didn't know how to read then. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, how to read might be good before you're selling those out. Um, yeah, exactly. What were you able to do just simple directions, like how to fold them and whatnot to, to make Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, was the, I was definitely the manufacturer of the product. Um, but as far as helping like to spell out some of the things on the website, my dad helped me with that. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, it was cool. I, I would just assume that but your dad or maybe both your parents are pretty entrepreneurial as well, if they taught you at such a young age. Yeah, no, they didn't. That's the funny part. Like they didn't encourage me to become an entrepreneur. I just kind of developed that on my own. Um, I always say that I have like a little brother. He couldn't care less about entrepreneurship. It's more that um, he kind of like enabled me to. So like when I started asking questions about entrepreneurship or finance, he was there to answer them, which I was really lucky to have. Very good. And when did you say you bought your first stock again? About how old? Eight years old. Eight years old. Uh, do you remember what brokerage it was back then? Fidelity. Uh, you've been using the same one ever since. So it's very easy to remember. Very good. I think back then there were some commissions, I think, to buy them, right? <laughs> there were. Yeah. Yeah. There were. It was, the, it was before the commission free era. I'm going to. That's why uh, back in like back in the day, we used to do this strategy where like I think you have to buy, we buy bulk at a time because if you like do smaller trades, the commissions would just kill you. Yeah. Uh, back to my old age here, back when I was in the 80s, I was around nine or 10 years old. My mom worked for Con Edison and their electric company in New York. And she worked there. We were able to buy commission-free trades back in the late eighties. So yeah, showing That's my it. old age, she was like, it doesn't make sense to pay all this in commissions when pretty much any company will probably lose out with the small amounts that you're investing with. Definitely. Yeah. How, how has it changed since uh, all, all these commission-free trades? I know Fidelity now does them for free as well as pretty much everyone else. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think there's a hidden fee model that's developed through Robinhood where they don't charge money directly off the trades, but I'm sure you may be familiar with, they charge money basically on the trades. So like you're not paying the exact price for the stock. You're paying a little bit more than that. And they're keeping that uh, bid ass spread. So yeah. So, I mean, that's the whole free trading thing sometimes is like just a marketing element and actually you're paying much more than you would in commissions or you're paying definitely a substantial commission just indirectly. But that's why I really like Fidelity. Fidelity doesn't do any of that. They legitimately have free products and they just are, they're willing to give you those free products because they think they're you're going to bank with them in some other way, either through a loan or just having a lot of money in a deposit account. Yeah. I know recently they did the completely commission-free index funds, correct? I think about yep, it. Correct. Yeah. They have like five, in, I think five index funds now are completely commission-free. Yeah. Which means yeah. they're losing money on them. Yeah, they are. But in the back end, they might get it on the other way. Um, speaking of the bid-ask price, I use Schwab and I changed from Vanguard. I'm mostly an option trader 
And Schwab does a walk limit order where you could actually determine the actual price that you're going to get. So you could start at the ask price and then go down near the midpoint and you could actually set the actual ranges to the penny or in a lot of options, you go up to $5. That's so, awesome. Yeah, yeah no, I use, uh, Young Investors Club uses Charles Schwab. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the exact same two that we're talking about I've used. Good program. Um, to share a little bit about the Young Entrepreneurs Club. Definitely like to hear your perspective or how you built it and what is it doing currently? Yes, it's the Young Investors Club. And it was built uh, when I was 14 years old, started with just one member, me. And uh, basically that year, I was looking for a way to invest money alongside other teenagers. Um, and the idea was that a, yeah, a bunch of teenagers were all going to put in $1,000 in the stock market, and we we're going to manage the money collectively together. So we went to a large parent network. Um, and I found basically after six months of going through decision makers, I finally got approved to be on their list of basically club or organizations that they approved of that they would email blast out to members to promote to their members. Mm -hmm. So after six months in my freshman year, I finally got put on that list and we launched the club. And that first year we had 20 members and $20,000 in assets. Uh, by junior year, we had close to, I want to say 40 members and over $40,000 in assets. And then uh, that year was the year that I decided I wanted to take this club to be the biggest, you know, the biggest it could be. And we grew to close to a hundred members and over $110,000 in assets. So wow. making us the largest that I'm aware of teen investing club in the country. Very good. How are you helping make that pitch for other teenagers to join your club? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, a lot of it was through convincing that parent network is being put on their email list, which had thousands of members on it. That's really how we were able to get a lot of that like leads. And then once they were showed they were interested, then it was just a question of showing them the benefits and the three main benefits were, it was really simple. It wasn't like a sales job because I didn't care whether they joined or didn't join. I didn't personally make money off them joining. It was more for them. Um, so it was kind of like, okay, one, it's an investment, not an expense. You can pull out a thousand dollars anytime you want would preferably, hopefully with more money since the investor portfolio has been growing over time. Number two, it's a great way to network with other teen investors out there. And number three, it's a great way to learn from other teen investors out there who are already, you know, investing in the stock market. And we also bring in speakers. So it was a really great way to educate teenagers about stock market investing. Awesome. Um, was it a communal group of what type of securities you wanted to invest in, or was it up to the individual people to decide? So no, yeah, the whole group would decide what we want to do with the hundred thousand dollar plus portfolio, and we decide, okay, we want to put, you know, this much money in this stock, or this much money in this fund, or this much money in this bond. Okay, was there quite a bit of changes over time, or were you pretty much buy and hold on the positions once you decided? Once we bought a position, we generally tended to hold it, but usually on a quarterly basis, we make at least one change in allocations, whether taking more from position. Uh, put taking less from position, and putting more into another, or uh, you know, using up some cash, whatever the case would be. Oh, great. Um, what are some ways that you might help motivate other other peers around your age to invest? Uh, I'm a high school science teacher. I actually have a homeroom class of 12th graders, and you know, I try different things to try to keep them motivated. And some are interested in it. Some are trying to think more entrepreneurial, but some of them are just like, ah, I don't really care much. What are a few ways you think you might be able to motivate others? I mean, I'd say get them all a copy of my book. That's the first thing right there. In fact, you know, one thing I could talk about with doing with you is I'm not sure if your school offers this, but maybe we could do like a Zoom virtual workshop for investing where I could like zoom in for like half an hour and just talk about investing, give like some free advice and promote the book. Right. Um, yeah, I don't know if you'd be open to that, but anyway, something, something cool I've been thinking about doing. Right. Um, so what was I going to say? Oh, yeah. So first get the book. In addition, there's tons of other free resources and small expense resources out there online, tons of YouTube videos you can learn about investing, like this channel, for example. Um, but as far as like really getting them motivated, kids, you know, not every single kid is interested in investing, but every single kid is interested in money. Well, the money gets every single kid's attention. So I think just kind of laying out, making very clear that like if you start 
these investing principles when you're early. Like apparently when you're younger, someone did a calculation like $1 now is worth the same as like $8 in the future. Mm -hmm. So although the money like might not seem like a huge amount of money right now, it's going to compound and only continue to grow in the future. So really just kind of saying, you know, if you start doing this now, you could have a whole house paid off by the time you're 35, 40, if you really start adding to your investment portfolio and keep and it keeps growing. So I'd say just kind of selling that dream to them and that vision, that end goal is really a great way to get teenagers interested. All right. Um, any type of things that you might show similar interests uh, with people your age compared to someone like me that you know, I'm 40 years old, I'm no spring chicken anymore, but uh, definitely give a different perspective with how to invest and why to invest. Yeah. Um, just giving a different perspective to older people or to... Can um, you like how would you do it as a peer compared to someone that is a little older and might have different perspectives? Yeah. I mean, like as a peer, a lot of it was, it was kind of like peer to peer when I was teaching in the young investors club. Like I was just basically teaching other kids my own age. In fact, that's kind of what led me to write the book because I had had so much experience teaching other teenagers about how to invest in the stock market. It made perfect sense to write a book about investing in the stock market for teenagers. Um, so yeah, I mean, just teaching other teenagers, same exact idea, like, Hey, you know, listen, like I know that if I start investing now and I start making money and adding money to the portfolio, it's going to do me so much good in the long run. Just kind of uh, showing them that end goal is really what can motivate them. And then to older people, because now like older people sometimes come to me for investing advice too, because I'm sure as you're aware, a lot of, you'd be surprised. There's not a lot of teenagers that know a lot about investing, but there's also not a lot of adults who know a lot about investing. Um, and to those people, I'd say like, you know, first of all, people live a lot longer than they did a long time ago. So if you're 40 years old, you're like halfway through your life. You have another huge, huge amount of time Let's left. A third by now. <laughs> or, or exactly. It might be a third. So, so it's like, it's like, yeah, you think, oh, I missed the boat. I'm too late. No, you're not. You got like another 50 years, which is like a whole lifetime from a few, from a few decades ago. Um, so so yeah, I mean, just kind of laying out how long that future is. And if you just start the investment portfolio now, it's never really too late to get started. Yep. Uh, what are a few of your general um, investing ideas? Are you more into small cap, large cap, value growth, crypto, anything like that? Yeah, so I'm into large cap buy and hold. Uh, that's been my strategy. It works for great for young investors. Young investors have long time horizons. You don't really have the time to day trade or do anything like that, but you have, you know, you just want to make a solid eight to 10 to 12% return, either investing in the SP 500, which is a great investment vehicle, I'd say for a ton of people out there. And I'd also say, you know, choosing a handful of stocks that you really believe in, you think are going to be long-term going to be here for the next 30 years. Like Amazon's the example I always give. I mean, there's a ton of large cap companies, but Amazon is just one of those companies they control close to 50 cents out of every e-commerce dollar spent in the United States. And e-commerce is just going to continue to grow and grow and grow. And I could see Amazon in 30 years. to the $2 trillion market cap. I could easily see that at a $10 trillion market cap. Um, so yeah, companies like that, that are stable, huge conglomerates that aren't going anywhere. Those are the kind of companies I like. Uh, I used to like dividend stocks a little bit more, but now with all the value tech stocks out there, it kind of makes more sense just to play off the appreciation because like a share of Amazon could easily go up 20% in one year, whereas a dividend you might be receiving from another stock is only like one or 2%. So dividends are not, I'd say right now, the best stocks to buy. Okay. Yeah. I was also about, sorry, I was about to ask about dividends as well. Um, you can do a little bit of both. Obviously the S P 500 has some of those dividend growth companies or pretty high yield companies. Um, so you're more of a fan right now on having companies reinvest the profits they make back into the company instead of paying it out in dividends to shareholders. Exactly. Yeah, that's what I'm more of a fan of. Then there's other there's other higher income producing assets other than dividend stocks if you're looking for uh, monthly income or quarterly income. Mm -hmm. Have you looked into any alternative investments, cryptocurrencies and whatnot? Yep. So I have a cryptocurrency, which by the way, you can check out on my YouTube channel. I also have a YouTube channel. And I made a video about how I invested $5,000 in Ethereum at $1,700 uh, Ethereum. I don't even know what you call it. Um, and and then I, whatever, I don't think it's like worth 1.8 times that now, something like that. So that investment's done really well. Um, that's, that's really my only exposure to cryptocurrency. And... Yeah. I mean, I don't really know anything about it. Don't pretend to know anything about it. Mm -hmm. I just know that Ethereum 
I think it's likely that those kind of cryptocurrencies, especially the strong blue chip ones like Ethereum and Bitcoin, are going to continue to grow for three reasons. One, millennials um, are really good at adopting the concept of online money. You know, like millennials and Gen Z grew up with the idea of online money. All the money's on like a bank account on their phone. And the older generations just never saw that. They always had to see the physical thing. So millennials are more used to digital currencies. Two, um, millennials and Gen Z are... I think that they're more likely to, to, what was the, what was the second reason I was good? Well, oh yeah, the first, also second inflation. So inflation's eating away the US dollar every single year, you know, you're losing 2%, whereas the cryptocurrency is fixed amount of them. And number three, I think that cryptocurrencies are great investments to other alternative investments like gold. I think cryptocurrencies are way more efficient. You don't actually have to hold the physical thing, but it's a virtual kind of version of gold. So those are the three reasons why I think it'll continue to grow. But besides that, I don't pretend to know too much more about it. Yeah, uh, I do some option selling on Riot, Mara, BTBT. They're companies that look for mining for these Bitcoins and whatnot and try to find them that are pretty much lower than the current price. Say um, Mara is around $30 a share. Just make a side bet with someone essentially selling a cash secured put around 25. So you have some downside protection. And then if it hits 25, you're agreeing to buy at that price. But if not, you get to collect the premiums. So it does correspond with the Bitcoin price quite a bit. Um, what about other type of entrepreneurial things like side businesses, anything that you're interested in doing yourself? In that yeah. Part? Um, so a few things, well, first of all, the, the book has kind of turned into a business. I didn't really realize that would happen, but now the book produces like passive income every single month, which is really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, and I also do some, some marketing work for some other businesses where I help some businesses with their online uh, presence on uh, online. So that, yeah, that's what kind of entrepreneurial activities I'm involved in. What other passive income streams are you thinking of maybe long-term five, 10 years down the road? Um, I mean, I'd like to get, let's see. I like the idea of some kind of some kind of monthly or, or quarterly income. I'm not sure exactly where that's going to come from. Maybe a REIT. I think REITs is a, is a strong place, especially if you find the right one, mm-hmm. or maybe some kind of real estate syndication, something like that, where you can you know invest in it and get a strong 8% return every single month or every single um, year on a monthly basis. Mm-hmm. So yeah, those kind of two investments I'd like to get in the future. Yeah, Realty income is one of my largest holding, ticket symbol O, and they pay monthly dividends. They've been increasing their dividends for decades now. And um, I know there's a view of these other um, yield street, I think, and whatnot, where, or Fundrise, where you could do partial amounts, like partial deposits into large properties. Yeah, Fundrise. Yeah. And you know, there's a bit of a big guy. Uh, there's some other influencers that also have their own real estate syndication funds. Mm-hmm. All right, great. Uh, do you have any questions for me in general? I think I have a little yeah. questions I had for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, first of all, it was cool to, uh, to meet you on here. But a few questions I had for you. So one, like, obviously, I think you're kind of paving the path like a teacher. Someone generally people wouldn't consider a teacher to be an investor. So I think you're like kind of breaking down that kind of route and just showing that, first of all, like, you know, anyone, no matter what profession you are, can invest. But I'd also say, like, you know, what's your biggest advice? Like, how have you as a teenager, how have you as a teacher who generally people say, like, you know, people don't go into teaching to make millions of dollars? How in general have you as a teacher still been able to use that to? build up a sizable investment portfolio? Like what have you done? What strategy have you used? All right, good question. Um, I initially started as a financial advisor. I worked at Ameriprise and I thought it would be good at actually helping people with their money, you know, with their investments and whatnot. But it ended up being just a sales job to me where a lot of times we would be giving advice on pretty high high feed mutual funds that are not necessarily in the best interest of the client. And then again, it felt like a sales job, just finding more and more clients, not necessarily helping them out with it. Uh, I did have a science background, so I was a biology major, and then I was easily able to get into science teaching. So I've been teaching for like 15 years now at this point. Um, I always knew that if I'm going to be a long-term teacher, I'm going to have that pension, which is pretty rare. And I know I'm going to have a fairly stable income. You could treat it almost like a bond fund. And we don't know exactly what's going to happen with pensions in the future for teaching, but in general, most states, I'm in Texas, they're relatively stable and you could make a fairly decent prediction of what the monthly income is. So I knew that if I teach until probably 60, 62 years old, I'm going to be getting almost 80, 85% of my income the rest of my life for just teaching. So 
I knew that I already had that as a buffer. And then for the other side of it, what I'm noticing a lot of teachers are, they still want to stay in that safe side. They leave it in a savings account, maybe earning one or 2%. Maybe they start in the bond funds. But since I knew that I'm getting that pension, I made an investing philosophy in my head when I was like 28 years old. I'm going to go 100% in the stock market until I'm 50 years old. And then at 50, I'll probably start adding a little bit of more conservative, safer bonds and whatnot. Um, that was a great idea. Yeah. And then a few years ago, I just thought this would be a good avenue to go about actually teaching people about different investing philosophies. Um, I did a lot on dividend investing about a year ago, been looking at individual company analysis. And now I've switched gears quite a bit into option selling. So looking at selling premiums to get income as well. And that's gone very well in the last few months. Oh yeah. I'm thinking about doing option selling as well. I've heard you can make about 12% a year, right? 1% a month. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to put it to heart right now. My goal and I'm doing videos every week is 2% a month. And the last, say January, I was at like 16%. It was crazy. February is about 13% and March and April are about 6%. So I don't, I don't necessarily think it's going to last that long. The market could easily fall, especially the VIX has been. Selling options, you're making 6% a month? Yeah, it's just selling options. So essentially, you look for a company that's at a certain price. You may or may not necessarily want to own it, but I use what's called the wheel strategy. So again, say you have a stock that's at $30 a share. You want to find a good support level where it typically doesn't go much below maybe say $25, so lower than the current share price. And then you essentially make a side bet with someone saying, you know, stocks at 30, I'll be willing to buy at any time in the next month at say $25. So you do have a little bit of a cushion there. Obviously, if I'm going to be making this bet with someone, I need to get paid for it because I'll be taking a lot of risk if the stock completely tanks to say $10 a share. But if the stock covers above 25, you'll get to keep the premium. And I typically look for premiums that are about 4% a month. So you're talking about buying options or is that selling? No, we're selling the options. So in the other you hand, the stock already? someone's actually buying the option that I'm selling. So it's working. So do you own the stock already or you're just buying? If them you right? own the stock already, it's called a covered call, which is typically the second side of what's called the wheel strategy. So the first side is usually called a cash secured put. In that case, let's say I'm making the bet that'll be $25. Maybe they'll pay me $100 for this particular bet that I'm making. Um, for $25 a share, you have to do 100 share lots. So you have to put up $2,500 into your brokerage account, just leaving it in case it gets to 25 or lower. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So you're so you're talking about which options are you selling? Are you selling? Are you selling call options? I'm selling put options. So put selling options, put options. they go lower. And then let's say I do get a sign. Let's say the stock goes to 23. At that point, I'm obligated to buy a $25 a share. So I'm down $2 a share times 100, which is $200, minus the premium that I'm collecting for the bet that I make. But then once you're assigned the shares, you essentially go the other direction, and then you sell the calls which is called a covered call because you already own the shares. Gotcha. So let's oh, say the awesome. stock again was at 23. I would sell a covered call at 25. Again, the same price that I initially bought it at. If the stock goes way past 25, it's like 27, 28. I'm again collecting that premium, that side bet that I made. And then I'm net even on the actual share price when I bought and sold it, but I'd be up on the premiums that I received. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. All right. So I like that strategy a lot. I think that'll be really helpful for some, for some viewers. Um, my other question is to be, so, you know, you've obviously built up a channel on YouTube. I'm just curious, does anything, uh, anything good come out of that channel? Any, any benefits from that? Uh, I do. It is a monetized channel. So I'm receiving some income on it every month. Um, Google will typically pay hundred dollars out of time. As long as you hit that hundred dollar or more than that. I'm typically averaging about $70 to $90 a month, depending on the month that I have. And then I also did recently set up a Patreon where it's a monthly membership. Uh, what I do is I offer two to three possible trades that people could make every day. And then I'm doing all the data on the support levels, the percent gain, the probability that I might reach that price or not. And I'm looking for high probability trades. So I do a monthly Patreon on that where we're at already 13 members and they're paying $20 for that service. 
Oh, that's awesome. So you built uh, you built two real businesses out of it. It's always funny how the uh, yeah. the add-on services to YouTube always make a lot more than the actual YouTube ad revenue itself. It does happen a bit, but I do use the YouTube as that initial um, you know avenue that people can understand the strategies because a lot of people that when they first start out, I'm not going to just try to sell them the benefits to actually getting these trades. I want them to educate them first, to understand the reasoning why we actually go about the methodology that we do. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. Well, that's really cool. Um, let's see. I don't know. Anything, anything last you want to talk about? I mean, you know, have you ever taught any students about investing? Have, have any yeah. students really learned from you? Yeah. Again, I do have a homeroom. So twice a week for 30 minutes, I do have essentially a hostile room that has to listen to what I say. Obviously we're going to be talking things like colleges, some basics on saving, you know, how to pay for college, student loans, things like that. And that's the main focus of what a lot of the students that I have and their questions on it. Uh, And then I do briefly touch on investing when they're interested in it. Um, The issue I'm having is having a pretty small percentage of my group are actually interested in the growing the money side. They're more interested in the applications for the near future. Like, how do I not get a college degree with $50,000 in student loans? Right. That makes total sense. Like, you know, instead of trying to grow their small investment portfolio right now, a few thousand dollars into 10,000, they want to try and figure out how to minimize that expense down the line, which makes total sense as a student myself. I kind of see, I can see it kind of see a lot of students are just thinking about the short-term debt option. Um, Okay. So that's really cool. So you teach students in school. What do you think about those forced learning options versus like optional learning? So Mm -hmm. do you think it'd be more beneficial having students choose the option to take an investing class or do you think forcing them to take an investing class would have a bigger impact on them? Which do you think would be better? Yeah, good question. I know some states are making it required now to do like a basic personal finance course, while other states, they do have an optional course for that. I know in Texas, it's not required. They do have to take economics. And a lot of the economics teachers I talk to do, you know, the free stock market challenge or the fake money and whatnot. But they briefly touch on these personal finance concepts. Um, I think it's just having that organic knowledge of thought of understanding why i think that's more important in general i mean i don't think it's necessarily a bad idea to have a required course but uh, i'm already getting some rumblings i had three students um two of them aren't even my students but they just hear what i'm saying in homeroom they're interested in learning more about this so we are going to start an actual investing club as well i'm not sure if we're going to do with actual money or not but definitely want to teach them you know basic the stock market different retirement accounts and whatnot yeah, yeah, totally. Well, hopefully we can send some books to your school and, you know, those could help be educate. Those could hopefully be educational that'll, to our students. That'll be great. And definitely if you want to speak to any of our, our students as well, we definitely should set that up with that. All right, cool. We'll talk about that offline. Um, all right. Well, anyway, yeah, it was really, it was really great talk with you, Mr. Investing Teacher. Uh, very cool what you've done with the YouTube channel. As I said, a lot of teachers aren't as focused probably on investing as they should be. And they're kind of taking those safer options when, you know, they could actually take a similar amount of risk and get a lot higher return following some of the strategies you do in the stock market. So I really appreciate your time. Glad we could set this up and uh, yeah, looking forward to staying in touch in the future. Yeah, that was great talking to you, Jack. I wish a lot of other people your age would be just as motivated as you are to uh, keep growing in their investing journey. And it's been great talking to you as well. Thank you so much. All right. Um...